The Middle East Institute at Georgia State University presents Arabic Grammar Unpacked. In this lesson, we will be talking about direct objects and direct object pronouns. When we're given an example like this, La uhib an ahdur as-saf fi sabah, I don't want to go to class in the morning. The word as-saf here is what we call the direct object of the verb ahdur. That is, it is the person or object that receives the action of the verb. So what don't I like to do? I don't like that I attend class in the morning. The class is what is being attended here. So it's the direct object. In this example, darastu atarikh fil maktaba. I studied history in the library. At tarikh here is the direct object of the verb darastu because it's what I studied. It's what received the action of the verb. Hal qarati adurus al jadida ya zahra. Hey zahra, have you read the new lessons? What has zahra read or not read? The new lessons. This is the direct object of the verb karati here. Katabet nur risalatan tawilatan laylat ems. Nur wrote a long letter last night. What did nur write? A long letter. It's the direct object of the verb. In Arabic, we call a direct object al maf'ul bihi. That which has been done to it is something like what that means. In English, we just call it a direct object, and it is the person or object that receives the action of the verb. In this lesson, we're going to talk about direct objects and how they're used, and how sometimes the case marking system can cause things to be a little bit confusing for you. And then we're going to talk about how to replace a direct object with a direct object pronoun, changing I attend class to I attend it, for example, which is a little bit trickier in Arabic than it is in English, as with most grammatical issues. So what we have to do in order to make this work right is to divide Arabic verbs into verbs that don't take prepositions, like darasa, or qara'a, or kataba, or daraba, to hit or strike something. All of these verbs can just be used as verbs with object. An adrus, a tarikh, an akra, a durus al jadida, an aktub, risalatan tawila, an adrub, dalika shab, I hit that guy. So in each case, we could put a direct object after the verb without using a preposition. Sometimes we will, an adrus fil mektaba, for example. But for the most part, these verbs can be used without prepositions. We contrast that with verbs that always must have a preposition. Like, ذهب إلى, I go to. You don't just أذهب something, you أذهب إلى someplace. You don't just أبحث something, you أبحث عن something, you look for it, search for it. حصل على, when we use the verb حصل, we always have to use the preposition على before the thing that we're getting or obtaining. Najahat fi, in Arabic we succeed in something, and it always takes its preposition. Now, there are some verbs that can be used with or without prepositions, like I just said. You could say hadara, for example. Hadara by itself means to attend or be present at something. But hadara ila means to come to or arrive at something. Daraba means to hit or strike something. But daraba bi means to hit or strike something with something else, where the bi takes the place of English with. So sometimes the same verb can be used in one way or the other. The important part here is whether the verb is going to use a preposition before what we would think of as its object. Most of this lesson will address verbs without prepositions. At the very end, I'll bring back verbs with prepositions and then talk about how sometimes the preposition and the pronoun can get together and do strange things. But let's begin with the simplest here. We'll use verbs without prepositions. لا أحب أن أحضر الصف في الصباح. I don't like that I attend class in the morning. Remember that in Arabic, whenever we talk about something in the abstract or in general, we try always to use alif lam. So it says, I don't want to attend the class in the morning. We really mean, I don't want to attend class in the morning. In this case, the word asaf is in what we call the mansub case. It has a single fatha as its case marking because it's definite. And it's in what we call the mansub or accusative case in English. It's the direct object. 
and a direct object that directly follows a verb will always be in the monsulb case, though things can sometimes get a little bit complicated with these. We could say darastu atarich fil mekteba. Again, atarich is the direct object of the verb, so it's in the monsulb case, and it's definite, so it's marked with a single fatha. We can say hal karati adurus al jadida ya zahra. And both durus, lessons, which is the direct object of the verb karati, and al jadida, which is the adjective that agrees with it, are both in the monsub case, because any adjective is always in the same case as the noun it modifies. Here we have ketabet nur risalatan tawilatan laylat ems. Nur wrote a long letter last night. In this case, Risala is indefinite. It doesn't have alif lam on it. So for that reason, we mark it with what we call tenwin al fat, which is pronounced n. If we were going to read this sentence out fully, we'd say katabet nur risalatan tawilatan leila tems. So we'd hear the little ten after the tam arbuta each time because it's a direct object, so it's in the monsul case. It's indefinite, so it gets what we call tenwin endings and its adjective is going to be in exactly the same case because an adjective is in the same case as its noun. Now, sometimes what we'll see is the direct object indefinite. Here it's definite. لا أحب أن أحضر الصف في الصباح But sometimes we want to say, I don't want to attend a class this morning. And of course, there's no word for a or an in Arabic. We simply use the word in its indefinite form. But Words that are in the monsub or accusative case and indefinite take this little tenwin al fat character. And unless the word ends with tam arbuta or hamza, we always, for reasons that date back to the Quran, add an extra alif. I always phrase it to students as tenwin al fat has a bad knee. So if he can't sit on the tam arbuta or lean on the hamza, he needs to lean on an alif as a cane. The alif isn't pronounced here at all. It's simply a chair for the tanween al fat in the same way that sometimes the dhamma or the dotless letter ya yeah can be used as a chair for the hamza. So we would pronounce this, la uhabbu an ahdura safan fi sabah, where we hear the n of the tanween al fat but we don't hear the alif at all. To make this still more confusing, in printed texts, you will always see the alif but almost never see the tenwin al fat. So you'll sometimes be confronted with a word you know, like sof, and then it's got an extra alif tacked on at the end for no apparent reason. And what I want you to think about when you're seeing these is to think about it as a direct object and that the alif there is just there to hold up the tenwin al fat. It's an object marker, a case marker, rather than a letter that's actually pronounced. When we have the sentence, Hal karati ad al jadida ya zahra. Both durus and jadida are in the mansub case, so they get marked with fathas, but they're both definite, so in this case they only get marked with a single fatha. Remember, non-human plural is feminine singular, and that, that's why jadida has a tamar bulta on the end. But if we say, did you read new lessons, Zahra, now durus is indefinite, so it drops its alif lem, but because it does not end with either tam arbuta or hamza, it needs an extra alif for the tenwin al fat to lean on. So we would pronounce this durusen, with the tenwin al fat getting its n pronunciation, but the alif not being pronounced. In the case of jadida, it needs tam arbuta because durus is non-human plural and therefore feminine singular, but it doesn't need an extra alif because the tenwin al fat can simply sit on top of the tam arbuta and be perfectly comfortable. So this can often be confusing, especially for intermediate level students. So pay very careful attention when you see a word that you otherwise know that has an extra alif tacked onto the end, because this is usually what it is. In this slide here, we can look at two different ways of getting across what we would think of as a direct object. We could say, لا أحب أن أحضر الصف في الصباح. I do not like that I attend class in the morning. So we've used the conjunction an and the verb in the monsub mood of the verb to subordinate it to the main verb أحب here. Or we can use the mustar of the verb. This comes from an earlier lesson. We could say, La uhibbu hudura saf 
this sabah, where we've replaced an plus the verb in the mansub with the mustar of the corresponding verb. But if you look, we can see here that la uhabbu an ahdura asaf fis sabah. We have asaf is in the mansub case because it's the direct object of the verb ahdura. But in this case, now asaf is in the majrur or genitive case. And the reason for this is because when we put it after hodor in this way, when we use the mustar of the verb, we're actually forming an idafa. Hodor asaf means the attending of the class. And all non-first words in an idafa are always in the majrur or genitive case. So in the first of each of the pairs of examples, we have a verb and its direct object. In the second of each pair of examples, we have a mustar and a noun in an idafa relationship. They get across the same point, I don't want to go to class in the morning, but they do it a little bit differently grammatically, and it would really behoove you to get on top of this subtle but kind of important difference as you move forward into intermediate Arabic. Again, the first one, a verb and its object. The second one in each pair is the mustar of that verb in an idolfa relationship with the noun that follows it. Take another couple of examples. Nuridu anakra adarsa fil mekteba. We want that we read the lesson in the library. So here, adars, the lesson, is in the mansub case because it's the object of the verb nakra. But if we replace an nakra with the mustar of the verb qira'a, now we have nuridu qira'a tadarsi fil mekteba where what we want is now qira'a, that's the direct object of nurid now, and ad-dars is in an idolfi relationship with qira'a. So this sentence really reads something like, we want the reading of the lesson in the library. They get across the same point, but they do it a little bit differently grammatically, and it's very important that you can pick up on the difference between these two things. Nurid an nakra ad-dars al-jadid fil maktaba. We want that we read the lesson that is new in the library. Here we have nuridu qira'at ad-dars al-jadid fil maktaba where instead of having a dars be the direct object of the verb nakra, now it's in an idafa relationship with the noun qira'a. So because it's the non-first word in an idafa, it's in the majur case, and therefore its adjective is as well, and that's why they're both marked with a kesra here. This is the sort of thing that once you internalize, you'll have a very easy time with, but it will be a little bit confusing at first. So again, back to our main example. La uhibbu an ahtur asaffa fi sabah. I do not like that I attend a class in the morning, where asaf is the direct object of the verb ahtura. What don't I like to attend? I don't like to attend class. Therefore, it's the direct object. Now, asaf is a masculine singular noun. If we were going to replace it with a pronoun as the subject of a sentence, we'd call it hoa, not he or hom or anything else. So when we want to change the direct object into a pronoun, with verbs that don't use prepositions, like ahdor here, all we have to do is put the appropriate pronoun at the end of the verb. And it's the same pronoun we're going to use for the possessive suffixes, with one exception, which I'll get to in a moment. So ho is, can mean his in the sense of kitabahu, his book, or ghorfatahu, his room. But it can also mean him in the sense of la uhibbu an ahdurahu fis sabah. I don't want that I attend it in the morning, where presumably we've already established what that it is. If the object is feminine, it's going to be represented by hiya, and therefore ha. So we'd say Ketabet Nur, Risalatan, Pawilatan, Laylat Ems. Nur wrote a long letter last night. Now we're going to say Nur wrote it last night. So we simply attach the pronoun to the end of the verb. And in this case, PowerPoint has not done me any favors because the ta in Ketabet should attach to the ha as the pronoun, but it wouldn't do it for me because I changed colors on it. So what we do is we attach the pronoun to the verb, again, trying to connect them where possible. This can cause the object to go in front of its subject. So in English, this reads, 
uh, she wrote it, Nur, Leila Temps, where Nur is actually the person doing the writing, not the thing getting written, which is a little bit confusing in terms of word order for an English speaker, but isn't something you should have a hard time getting used to. If we look at this example, I can say, I know these guys from history class. would be replaced with hum, so all I have to say is, Min sof atarich. I know them from history class. This is really pretty simple for the most part and shouldn't present you with any huge problem. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that if I say Karatna, we read Kutuben Kathira, many books, Fidalika Sof in that class. Kutub is non human plural. So if I said it in English, I'd say we read them in that class. But in Arabic, I have to say, we read her in that class, because of course, non-human plural is feminine singular. And all you have to do is add the pronoun onto the end of the word. Karatnaha looks a little bit odd with all those alifs, but that's actually correct. The only real difference is when we get to the ana pronoun, which I will in a second. But the second person pronouns are very easy to deal with. Ohebbuk or really, uhibbuka, although almost no native speaker would ever say that. Uhibbuk, I like you. La na'rifuki, we don't know you, where the person here is a woman that we're talking to. Again, in speech, most of the time, those last vowels would be left off. We can say, uridukum an takra'u hadha dars, I want you all to read that this lesson. Here, all we have to do is put the pronoun kum on the end of the verb. Hal turiduna anakra adars al akhar. Do you want us to read the other lesson? Again, these are simply the possessive pronouns with one difference, which is ana. So we could say, dalika shab la yuhibbuni. Instead of simply adding the e for the possessive my, we add an extra noon in here as well. And this is simply for historical reasons. So, la yuhibbuni. He, uh, that guy does not like me. Or I could say, Mada turiduni an akra. What do you want me to read? Really, what do you want me that I read is what we're saying here. So again, with the ana, we change the e to ni, but all of the rest of the pronouns are exactly the same as the possessive set of pronouns. So they shouldn't really present you with any meaningful problems when learning to do this. Keep the ni in mind. Now, Many verbs use prepositions. The habtu ila al maktaba leilat ams. I went to the library last night. Hal tabhathina an markaz al riyada. Are you looking for the gym? Nurid al husul ala. Here I've used the mustar. Takdir mumtaz fi hada saf. We want to get a wonderful grade in this class. Tilka a taliba tanjah fi kul sufufiha. That student succeeds in all of her classes. Each of these verbs uses a preposition, so they're going to be a little bit different when we put them in the pronoun form, their objects in the pronoun form. We're going to add the pronoun to the preposition, not to the verb. So, for example, the habtu il al maktaba leilat ems, we could replace al maktaba with the pronoun hiya because it's feminine singular, and then we're going to add that to the ila, not to the, the habtu. Hal tabhathin an markaz riyada. Now notice that both al maktaba and markaz are in the majrur or genitive case because every noun that comes immediately after a preposition is always in the genitive or majrur case. Nurid al husul ala taqdirin mumtazin fi hadha saf. Here, taqdir is not only majrur because it's after a preposition, but it's also indefinite, so it gets the comparatively rare tanween al-kasr ending, which is pronounced in. Nuridu al-husul ala taqdirin mumtazin fi hadha saf, although very few people would actually pronounce those endings. Tilka taliba tanjah fi kulli sufufiha. Both kull and sufuf are in the majrur case because they come right after a preposition. So again, when we tack them onto a verb, we're going to tack them onto the preposition, not onto the verb itself. We can say, Hal tabhathin an markaz riyada, where markaz, the center, really, markaz riyada means the sports center. 
is masculine singular and can be replaced with huwa. So we'd say, Hal tabhathin anhu? Are you looking for it? We do this in English as well, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal to get used to. The trouble is, preposition plus pronoun can sometimes result in some weird spelling irregularities. Anhu isn't too bad, but sometimes they get a little weirder than that. Tilka taliba tanjah fi kul sufufiha, that student succeeds in all her classes. Kul sufufiha is feminine singular because it's non human plural. So we'd say, Tilka taliba tanjahu fiha, she succeeds in them, in her, in Arabic. So these aren't too hairy to deal with, but some of the prepositions get a little bit more problematic. Vehabtu il al maktaba leilat ems. I went to the library last night. Al maktaba is feminine singular, so you're going to replace it with ha, but it's going to become vehabtu ilay ha leilat ems where the alif maqsura in ila is going to change to a ya with a sukun over it. If I say, Nuridu al husul ala taqdirin mumtazin fi hadha saf, we want to get a wonderful grade in this class, we'd say, Nuridu al husul alayhi fi hadha saf. So, sometimes the preposition plus the pronoun can result in some weird little spelling irregularities. The best way to learn these is to read a lot and learn a lot of verbs and pay attention to what you're reading. And pretty soon you'll pick up on the major ways in which the preposition plus the pronoun can result in some irregular spe spelling. I could give you a table with the way that the various prepositions adapt to the various pronouns, but frankly, it's much easier to get if you just realize that they're out there and just continually practice by reading.